Hi everyone and welcome to part two of our series on how to create metadata and dic data dictionaries and codebooks. In this example I'm going to show you how to work data dictionary creator and codebook in our last video was a really good useful app when you just want to simply plug in a data set and let it take care of most of the work for you. Especially good if you have embedded metadata like with our SPSS files. However, let's say you have that CSV file or another file that doesn't necessarily have a lot of the embedded metadata and you want to enter that data yourself, but you need, you don't want to do coding. And this is where Data Dictionary Creator comes in. It's a web interface that allows you to enter most of this data um, if you don't have it already built into the data set. So on this home page, you get a little bit of instruction. And mainly this page tells you here to you know, welcome, come enter your data, and you can also close these um, boxes to make it easier to read. Because this is an online app, your data is not stored permanently. It's sort of, sort of temporarily while we work on it, and then once you close the app, it's gone. So here we have the option to upload the data, which is our first step, because you want to make sure your data imports right before you spend a lot of time typing information in. And so we have two kind of main options here. The first is nearly all data formats are supported. So this uses the Rio package, just like Codebook. So we can open uh, SPSS files, data files, text delimited files, comma delimited files, and it usually figures out for you by looking at the file. However, in our last video, I showed you that Qualtrics files, while they're usually comma delim delimited or tab space delimited, include two extra lines at the top. So you have the row of variable names, you have a row of metadata, and then you have a row of um, sort of import Qualtrics functions. And that um, is very shareable because it's in text format, so it's open source effectively. However, that makes it hard to, to read the file into other programs. So what we can do here is use that data still if that's the kind of format that you have. Let me show you an example. I'm going to hit browse. I'm going to go to where that is saved here. And when I first import it, it like it looks a little nuts because the second row of data has very long uh, information in it. Because this is a Qualtrics CSV file, I can click this button here. And what will happen in the background is it will read the first line of data as the column name. It'll take that second line of data and make that the column label. So it'll retain the, the information about the question. And then it gets rid of the third line. If you have what's called a legacy format Qualtrics file, it will um, read in those two lines. So Qualtrics format files now have three lines. Legacy or old formats have two lines. So we have some selected options here to help you deal with those types of files. The other types of files that we can handle are almost all of them, so we'll show you how the SPSS metadata is imported. So if you have that option, definitely take it because that will save you a lot of time in entering data information, but we've made this uh, accessible if you don't have that built-in data or you're going back and doing this on old data of yours. So I'm just going to reload this app and import my SPSS file which you don't really have to do. I'm just doing because we're working with a different example. So here's what the SPSS imported as. So it looks pretty much the same. And once you have the data uploaded, we just want to make sure that all of the information got pulled in correctly. So we'll click on variables here. And we'll scroll down and make sure this kind of table is there and looks OK. And then we can also click on category labels and just kind of make sure this table pops up. So if both of those tables appear you're good to start entering data. If one or, or the other is missing, you can certainly contact us to fix it. So we'll click here on variables. Every column and piece is explained up here at the top in case you forget, but let's just look at them now. First column here is the variable column. This is the column name from the data set that you uploaded. You want to leave this column name alone because it should match what's in the data set. So this just helps us map the, the variable name, its information, to the actual data. 
Number of unique values is auto-calculated. It's um, just a match of how many values are different from each other. So um, you will see that this may not be a super useful no information for start date, but it is pretty a pretty good one for finished, which is yes and no. Number of missing values is how many of those call, uh, pieces of information are in A or null in the data set. And so I had a cleared out IP address to de-identify this data set, so it makes sense that all the data is missing. The number of levels here is sort of calculated based on the, the labels that are in the data set or the number of unique values that are like sort of less than seven. Okay, so finished, the labels here are zero and one because that's how Qualtrics coded, either not finished for zero or finished for one. We pick a different column so kind of skip forward in the data set. These questions are sort of survey style questions. So the number of levels is one through six. All right. The description here is, it says required because we'd like you to enter this information to make data minimally accessible. And you'll see some of them have information entered and some of them don't. And this is where you'll want to fix the ones that say enter here. Okay. The ones that do have this have auto embedded labels. So the information from Qualtrics was that this was question was about the first click timing okay, for this particular page. The most useful thing that I could probably enter here was the actual question scene. Okay. So what is your race or um, there's a gender question in here. What is your gender, right? So we could want to fill in like, what is the what is the actual thing that the person saw? Scroll over some more. Type here is the type of information in that in that column. So character is text, numeric are numbers, and then you will see some that say date in them as well. Minimum allowable is the min value that's in the data set. Maximum value is the maximum value. Those are pre-coded based on the data that is imported. If you know this column is actually one to seven, you would want to change this information. Missing allowed, everything is set currently to true. However, if you uh, did not want missing allowed, like essentially in your data, they were, they were forced to answer that question, you could change this to false. The missing value, so if you have a special code for missing values, like um, for a long time for SPSS it was 999, you could enter that here. And then synonyms is kind of a special column for helping explain what those some of these data pieces might mean. So let's say you had an abbreviation in one of these titles that's a commonly well-known abbreviation in your area, but you're not sure people are going to know what it is in someone else's area. So you could explain out here. So this is a, a longer description. Now, how do you edit data? Well, in this format, it's really easy. You just double click on it and you can start typing. And then to save it, you just hit enter or tap. And so you could change all of these actually. I could say, oh, the maximum allowable here was actually seven. And this one actually cannot have missing data, so it's false. So we've started by filling in most of the information as much as we can figure out from the data itself for you, and then you can go in and edit this yourself. Okay. So let's look at category labels. Now these are meant to be value labels if you're used to SPSS as terms, but this is the mapping of a number to text basically. Now what we did to start is for every column, it has the values and a potential description. For the start date, this doesn't make a lot of sense. But for questions that have coding, this does make a lot of sense. So question one three here is one of our survey response ones, and this tells you the value that's possible. One was listed as never true, two was listed as rarely true, and etc. So this is really helpful because this tells people the, the directionality of the scale and allows people to see the coding map onto the, the words that were on, shown on the screen. So the nice thing about using the SPSS formatted data, even though I wouldn't, maybe that wouldn't be the best way to share the data, is that this is all entered for me. Now, 
If you had multiple columns, so let's say you have a, a comma separated file, a text file, and you don't want to enter this 57 times because you have you know, 60 or more of these questions. Or if you're doing a very large survey, you might have 200 of these columns. What you can do is pick the column that you're interested in. So let's say I know I filled out question 2, 3. All right. So let's actually just do 2, 1. That's a little easier. I say take the information from question 2, 1, and now I can pick a bunch of columns to copy that to. So if I don't scroll too fast here, um, if I can find all the rest of the twos, say, so you know, I copy that to two, three, two, 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 four. So this is a fast way to copy, um, copy it to itself. That's a little silly. Um, all of the coding that you've done for one column to all of the columns that are ex exactly the same. So I can copy it from question one to question all of them. This saves you time from copying from typing in the same description over and over again. And you would click copy column, column values to do that. Now, uh, once you do that, it will refresh up here. These columns are actually already correct because they imported from the SPSS data, but that's how you copy them. All right, come over here and click on project info after I'm done with all of this. And what I'd want to do here is start typing the bibliographic information. So now that I've described each variable, this is really about where you collected the data, when you collected the data, how do people cite the data, who are you, that kind of thing. So I might type in a, uh, a title here. So I would say SIPs for data quality. I'd want to spell that out, but this example is from, from a workshop that I gave on data quality indicators. So then I could say, uh, this is workshop data. And I would want to explain the project. Data location, this will be in part three of our tutorial set, but this is where you're going to share the data, so where people can find it. And while it feels a little silly to type this in and then put it online, this will help when you index the data um, to, for people to find it because they will be searching for it maybe on Google's data set search and it'll have the link to the URL in more than one place. You could type in the date that the data is published. You could use this as the date that you put it online and think of publishing as posting online. You could actually use a published date um, if you publish the data and maybe an open data journal. You can, um, for that, we suggest using the sort of standard date format. So I could say 2019, 1205 or something. The citation might be how you want your data cited or the publication place. So here you could include a sort of formatted citation. Keywords will be ways for, the, for you to be able to search for the data, especially if the column names are not intuitive. License might be something like MIT, or um, there's several, a bunch of licenses, so you could look up um, data licenses or sharing licenses. I think the Open Science Framework has a really good set of descriptions of the types of licenses that people can use. And this will just say, hey, I want you to cite my data if you use it. Funders, if you have any. A description of where the data was collected. So for this study, I might say um, it was collected online with US participants. Project start date, again, I want to enter this. Um, I think we did this in like July. And project end date, I'd want to enter that as well. So I would type all this stuff in. The last piece of information is the people who, who do we cite for this, right? So the information about you as the author. Here I would, I could add data to add separate and new columns. So if you have more than one person that you need to add. And the first thing you want to enter is your ORC ID or some form of identifier for you. Generally, this is listed as the ORC ID as our best suggestion, but there are other pieces that you could list here as, as your unique identifier. And ORC IDs are meant to be sort of barcodes for researchers. This is especially useful if you have kind of a common name or you've changed your name and you have publications under multiple names. 
So it allows you to list who you're also known as and um, sort of kind of keep all of your publications together. Lots of journals use these as ways to log into their journal site, but also they publish them with a little ID next to them. So to do that, I would just copy the link, the entire link, paste it in, and then the rest you would just type in. So first name, last or family name, your affiliation, which could be um, university or other, or research institution, or just individual, and then your email. And I could enter each of our researchers that was involved with this project. So all of this is sort of the recommended information from schema.org for data sets and um, sort of collections of information. So this allows us to find the best way to cite this and to learn more about the data. Once you've entered everything and you're sort of satisfied that all of the, the data's in there the best way that you have, you can click on output here. Now output comes in multiple formats and it's kind of up to you. So we created a CSV file that contains all the metadata that you entered in the variable step. Then we have a CSV file that's all the data that you entered into category label step. And this will just allow you to keep those CSV files in case you need them again. An R data file, which is specific for R folks, but does actually import and hold on to all of those labels. So let's say you spent some good time entering all this data on the upload data page later, if you're like, oh, I need to update that, you could just import that R data file for yourself and that will have saved everything you've done. And then the machine readable format that's probably the most helpful for indexing purposes is our JSON LD file. And so that kind of combines like, all of this into one machine readable file. Coming soon, we'll have the HTML readable report that kind of codebook makes. At the moment, there's um, uh, an error in something that Codebook is doing. So as soon as we kind of get that problem worked out, we'll have this working where you can actually create the Codebook as well automatically as an output. So you download all that data. And then if you ever have questions about the app or something's broken, you can contact us by um, clicking on the about page tells you a little bit more about the project. You can email me questions that you have or troubleshooting errors because there's probably something that someone will have that won't work quite right. We're, uh, and we're glad to improve the app as um, issues arise. And then you can also check out the paper that comes with this project. Okay. So this kind of ends the tutorial for creating the data dictionary. You can watch the tutorial for creating the codebook. Once you have your outputs made, you can move on to part three, where you go, what do I do with these outputs? And that'll be the final stage in uh, sharing open data.